Hello Scotland fans and welcome back to our series of tours around the great Scottish historical sites. And we're doing one that's a little bit different this time mm. because it's not a castle that's got necessarily a great military history or even a royal history, but there is very much a family connection which is a big part of Scottish history too. Where are we off to? Yeah, we're off to Crichton Castle, which um, where we're sitting right now in Edinburgh. It's only about 15 miles away, actually. Um, so it's one of what I like to call the backyard castles. You know, they're yes. not big and famous. They don't have a huge profile, but there's some brilliant stories surrounding them, and they're you know proverbially and sometimes literally actually in our backyards as well. So we're sticking in the Lothians for this one today. Yes, and quite right because the Lothians for me, I think, in terms of concentration. Mm -hmm have an absolutely gigantic amount of, of great ruins. Absolutely. I mean, this is one of the areas of Scotland in the south, of course, mm. which was you know, kind of a debated area. The English armies were constantly invading. The royals were trying to track, crack down and control it. Um, so lots of castles built for military purposes, but also lots of castles which were more just sort of lordly residences. Mm. And that's really what we're dealing with at Crichton Castle, yeah. primarily. So family home, first and foremost, mm. let's look at the Crichton family and the origins of this great place. Yeah, so the uh, Crichtons sort of really got their start with a, a land grant in the late 14th century, possibly early 15th. It's one of these things, you know, you give or take a couple of years, um, you run into this constantly with castles. It's like, yeah, it's approximately late 14th century, why not? Um, and it started out with a guy named John de Crichton. Um, and he built a big squat stone castle um, yeah. up along a, you know, a hill looking over a river um, to say, of Edinburgh, so close enough to um, what was becoming increasingly, you know, sort of the capital, um, but far enough away that it could be a nice little country retreat for uh -huh. him and his family as uh -huh. well. So he's yeah. thinking about relaxation. Is he thinking about defence as well? He's actually thinking primarily about defence, I would okay. say, right. um, okay. because the, the castle he built was um, a very sort of tough fighting castle um, with right. your arrow slits and thick walls, the whole nine yards, um, and it changed so much over subsequent centuries. It kind of reminds me of, uh, there's an old adage um, which really is you know, more sort of archaeology than history, but um, the, the adage is, you know, this is my grandfather's axe, I replaced the handle, my father replaced the blade. So it's like, right, okay. all right, you know, nothing materially is the same, mm -hmm. but he, no one can tell you that's not your grandfather's axe, yeah. right? Yeah. So in that same way, um, John de Crichton's castle, sort of, you know, tough brooding place, became a courtyard castle, which mm. was a bit more domestic, a bit more luxurious, um, where you can enjoy some of the finer things in life, but not missing out entirely on the defensive aspect as well. And it would need that, I suppose, because it is on the, the kind of main road between England and, and Edinburgh. So there's a lot of a lot of through traffic there. Absolutely. Not all of it's going to be friendly. Definitely not. And that was the case um, for long before Crichton Castle existed as well, um, because not too far from it um, is Deer Street, or the remains of Deer Street. It was one of the main Roman roadways, the arteries, into Caledonia, as the Romans would have called it. So for the last 2,000 years, armies have been marching back and forth up along that area to come into the heart of Scotland and try their best to conquer it with varying degrees <laughs> of success, basically. Yeah, it's not always the way. And um, what about the Crichton family themselves? Some of the big characters within that family circuit. Yeah, definitely uh, with the Crichtons, the one who really made their name, or unmade their name, I guess, in a yeah. certain way, um, was William Crichton. Uh, he was John's son, and he was an incredibly powerful man. He was keeper of both Stirling and Edinburgh castles at various points. Oh. Um, he was the Sheriff of Edinburgh. He was the Chancellor of Scotland as well. So one of the most powerful men in Scotland. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You did not want to get on his bad side, because he was not... But, um, above some conspiring, shall we say. Oh. Yeah, because um, even though Crichton Castle you know, never had a massive trebuchet lobbing stone balls at it or anything quite as dramatic as that, um, it was involved in a little thing called the Black Dinner. Ooh, and it sends chills straight away. Yes, this is one of those kind of so standout true. moments in, in Scotland's story, mm. which is it's just dreadful. It's, it's kind of up there, the, the kind of the massacres and the the great tragedies of Scotland's past, and we've had a few, this is this was one hell of a 
dirty. Uh, absolutely, and it was so bloody and brutal, actually, that it inspired George R. R. Martin to create the Red Wedding off the back of it. Of course. Yes. Of course. Uh, so and we... by the way, there is no one in the world more suited to make the comparisons between Scottish history and Game of Thrones <laughs> than David, who's just done a book on it. So there we are. Yeah, so we, we can say that we've got a Game of Thrones connections at, mm -hmm. at Crichton Castle, which never hurts, right? Kept yep. film Outlander everywhere, after all. Um, but uh, yeah, the Black Dinner, the historical event, became the Red Wedding in Game of Thrones. And basically, the, the scene you know, was in 1440. Uh, King was a guy named James II. Um, it's always difficult to keep track of which James did what, but it's easy with James II. He's the guy who got blown up by his own cannon. <laughs> if ever curiosity killed the cat, it got James II. He would have loved to sort of strut in front of his artillery. I mean, we all know guys like this, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, you like to be around things that go boom, um, and one day you get a bit too close. But anyway, that's <laughs> skipping ahead a couple decades. Um, in 1440, James II was only 10 years older. Can you imagine being king at 10? Yeah, the precocious type, you know, build me a football pitch. Yeah. Have a swimming yeah, pool, yeah. where's my sweetie shop? Yeah, I mean, I, I was building <laughs> Lego castles when I was 10 yeah. years old, but can you imagine yeah. me actually being able to build real castles? Yeah. Now we're talking, right? <laughs> so, You'd hope, anyway, that James II wasn't actually making too many of the decisions himself, right? Um, you never know, yeah, could have pulled well, it off brilliantly, yeah, but... Wouldn't put it past him. Eh, yeah. Probably not. <laughs> he was known as James with a fiery face, by the way. He had a birthmark uh, over half yeah, of his face, right, and yeah. it would become inflamed when he got angry, and apparently he got angry a lot. Right, um, yeah. So probably not the most rational, level-headed individual. Uh, but you can see why he was manipulated from such a young age by puppet masters like William Crichton. Um, and William Crichton sort of surveyed the, the state of Scotland at the time. And uh, there were a number of big noble families who were basically running the show, right? Okay, the king was the king, but yeah. these noble families, like the Douglases, could raise massive armies overnight. Mm -hmm. um, and if you want the most badass family in Scottish history, my money is firmly on the Douglases. What do you think? Uh, yes. <laughs> Staunch supporters of Robert the Bruce and the general cause of Scottish independence. Fierce. Psychotic. Uh, yeah, I think that, that latter word's a good one. Um, the historian Fiona Watson actually described James the Black Douglas, who was uh, Robert Bruce's lieutenant, as Scotland's greatest rag, which <laughs> was just the, the best description. Take that as a compliment, yeah. you know? Yeah. Living life in a constant state of outrage. Yeah, yeah. So, so you see the kind of guys we're dealing with here, right? And why William Crichton might not want too many of them kicking around. Uh, so he invited um, the Earl of Douglas, the head of the family, um, not a clan, because we are in the south of Scotland here after all and one misconception I don't know if you've encountered this a lot but a lot of people assume that if you're in Scotland you're a clan right mm. but that, that is, is not the case north. yeah it's exactly north. really it's a Gallic Highland institution more than anything but a noble family the Douglases and the guy in charge was also named William I know you're just gonna have to bear with us guys everyone was named like one of five names back then it's like well, William James. Alexander, James, yeah. yeah, you know, one or two others, yeah. that's about it. It makes a historian's life very, very difficult. <laughs> um, but so we've got a William going up against a William here. And um, William Douglas was only 18 years old. Uh -huh. um, so a little bit more mature than the king. He fought in a couple of battles by then, you know, like 18 going on 30 by our standards, right? Mm -hmm. But um, he was invited up to Edinburgh Castle to wine and dine mm -hmm. with... James II, and this was William Crichton who had issued the invitation. And All very nice and friendly. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Right Now, there's a thing in Scotland called guest right. Um, Neil, you are currently in my flat. Yeah. Right. Are, yeah. You, are you feeling pretty safe and secure here? Because you've given me a cup of coffee, I'm feeling all right. Oh, all right. right. If I hadn't had that, I'd be really nervous. Pretty confident I've not put any, uh, you know, poisons in the coffee yeah. or, you know, whoopee cushions on the chair or anything like that. Fairly. Yeah. Fairly. I think I trust you. Right. So, this is basically the heart of it, is... Um, um, guest right is the idea that if you are a guest in someone's home, mm -hmm. you're safe, right? Mm -hmm. And if you are a host with a guest in your home, you're safe from them. So it, it's reciprocal. Right. Okay. Right? I'm feeling fairly at ease here. But, um, Leave your knife at the door. There you go, yeah. Uh, this was violated in the most extreme fashion you can imagine, because William goes up to Edinburgh Castle to dine with James II um, at Crichton's invitation, and it all seems like it's getting off to a good start. Um, you know, French wine was flowing, all that good stuff. And then a lone piper entered the room, started playing a somber tune. A servant came in after him with a bull's head on a silver platter. And if anyone ever serves you a bull's head on a silver platter, start running as fast as you can, because this is an ancient uh, Celtic symbol uh, of death. Yeah. I'm vegetarian, so I don't know if it would have the same effect on me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, uh, so they knew at this point, impending death had been trapped by this 
But this king but also by his puppet master. Exactly. Obviously. As far as we know, the king wasn't even in on it. It ah, was all down to William Crichton. Okay. Um, and Douglas was taken on trumped up charges of treachery, of which he was not guilty, hanged, drawn, and quartered outside the castle gates. Oh. Pretty much the biggest violation of guest right that you could possibly imagine. Okay. Yeah. And it is very similar to the Red Wedding, of course, in Game of Thrones. So this was officially an inspiration for that, that particularly horrible chapter in the, the saga. Yeah, combined with um, the Massacre of Glencoe, which plays into the campbell Macdonald rivalry, of course, mm -hmm. which we'll be getting into um, in our video on Denure Castle uh, over in the West Coast yeah. coming up next. Um, if you want bloody and brutal, George R. R. Martin said, look no further than Scottish history, basically. <laughs> and the role that Crichton Castle played in all this was not just that it belonged to the man who orchestrated the Black Dinner. Um, J uh, William Douglas actually sort of stopped over at Crichton Castle on his way up to Edinburgh. Um, so little did he know that he okay. was uh, you know, being wined and dined on the coin of the man who would later display his head on a spear. Charming. Yeah. Charming. yeah. So there was the Creighton family, but then it, it, it passed to the Bothwells. Yes. Um, the Bothwells changed things up quite a bit. I mean, William Creighton developed his father's sort of squat stone tower into a courtyard complex, a little bit more relaxed. Um, but then the Bothwells really changed it up. And it was down to a guy named Francis Bothwell in the 16th century um, who made the most dramatic changes. Uh, because there's a few oddities at Creighton Castle, aren't there? I mean, what, what comes yes. to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, the interior is fascinating. I mean, there's a subtle yeah. kind of European influence things going on in terms of the architecture. But the, the surround is, is fabulous to me. It's this kind of this lovely little quaint valley, winding roads, mm -hmm. um, lots of arable land, and it's just so serene. There's nothing else around. Yeah. Which to me, yeah. Is, it's extraordinary to being so close to Edinburgh. And there's a couple of things that you wouldn't expect to see. Um, there's a stable block just outside the castle uh, itself, yeah. which has a distinctly Moorish twist to it. Yeah. Um, and that is thanks to Francis Bothwell. He travelled uh, extensively throughout Europe, mostly Italy, France and Spain. We know the kind of guy, right? You go away for a year on uh, on break, you know. Yeah, and, gap, you yeah. Know, find yourself. Exactly. Come back <laughs> acting all sophisticated, you know. It's exactly what Francis Bothwell would have done. Um, so he decked out his castle with a uh, Italianate diamond facade. Ah, which is, this is uh, where I'm coming from. Yeah, exactly. So very much this European influence yes. because, again, you know, there was this idea that Scotland was very much on the periphery mm -hmm. and Francis Bothwell wanted to bring all these sort of sophisticated content aspects back yeah. home to Scotland, which he did with stunning success. Um, he also installed um, a straight staircase. Ooh la la. Oh, fancy. I oh, know. I mean, yeah. to, just so you get the context here, guys, we're in a 19th century Edinburgh flat right now. You had to take more or less a spiral stair to get in here. Yeah. So this is... What we do. Exactly. Love our spiral stairs, for better or worse. Um, so a straight staircase was immediately sort of a statement of sophistication and worldliness, oh, really. Right. And, and that's the message that he was trying to convey. Uh, fortunately, you know, Crichton Castle didn't really outlast him by very long. It was mm -hmm. only really used for about 200 years. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it doesn't tend to pop up in some of the more sort of dramatic narratives, even yes. though it's got so much going for it. Yeah. Um, and not just the castle itself, but actually the area, because I mean, you've explored quite a bit around it. Yeah, and I just think the Lothians are just are fabulous in terms of the historic journeys that you can go down, the, mm -hmm. the exploration that you can find, the concentration of everything's fantastic. But for the most part, when you come to Scotland, mm -hmm. in terms of tourism, the idea is go to Edinburgh, go to the Highlands, Sky, Loch Ness, Glencoe, home. Yeah. And for some reason, anything south of Edinburgh seems to intimidate everybody. Which I've never understood, but it's southeast of Edinburgh here, 15 miles mm -hmm. or something. And yet you could have it almost entirely to yourself. Because mm -hmm. um, that journey south just seems to, to switch people off. Yeah, I think the busiest I've seen was when there was one guy putting up some scaffolding at yeah. one time, and that was it. Otherwise, entirely to yourself. But it's uh, one of the most photogenic ruins in Scotland. How is this possible? Oh, absolutely. There's so many brilliant vantage points yeah. that you get Crichton from, especially um, sort of if, you know, if you're an early riser, go in the early hours or at sunset, um, you get magnificent lighting cast over the castle in the valley. And it's right around the corner from Borthwick Castle as well. Of course, yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. And not so far from the borders, and then all of the, the the borders, abbeys, and all the ruins of around there as well. This is a this is an area where history just lives. 
Absolutely. Um, some unexpected stuff around there as well. For instance, did you know that you can find Pegasus nearby? What's, what's yeah. Pegasus? You're right. So there is a little thing called a souterrain around the corner from Crichton Castle. I say around the corner, it's about a mile and a half away. Um, it's around the corner when you've got a bike lane, mm. usually do to pop around, right? Um, to get there, by the way, uh, just you know, public transport, you can go to Gore Bridge. There's a railway station there. Um, then it's only about two miles away from Gore Bridge, so it's really, really easy to get to. And um, while you're in the area, pop by Borthwick Castle, go to Crichton Castle, and then go to Crichton Souterrain. And the Souterrain was sort of an Iron Age tunnel, kind of like a pre-refrigerator, refrigerator sort of idea, right? It's your, your cool box, you keep all your victuals under the ground. And um, it probably used some recycled stones from a Roman fort nearby, and there's a carving, very distinctly, of Pegasus uh -huh. on one of those stones in the suit tray. Now, okay. you're getting down on hands and knees for this, right? And you're sort uh -huh. of having to uh -huh. go through this quite spooky little tunnel, so bring a head torch and all that. Um, but it's one of the sort of hidden pieces of history okay. in the Lothians, which it's are It's not an official attraction, is it? No, it's not. I mean, Crichton Castle is run by Historic Environment Scotland, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, Crichton Sioux Terrain, um, it's in the middle of the field. All you have to yeah. do is get past the resident sheep <laughs> and you're good to go, you know. <laughs> Fantastic. And we hope then that you've enjoyed an alternative look at Crichton Castle. We are nothing if not flexible. This is a very different kind of Scottish castle experience, but one that we hope you've enjoyed too. Yeah, and do make sure to leave a like, of course, if you've enjoyed this, and subscribe, because we've got lots more stuff coming up, including a venture out west, more towards Neil's neck of the woods. Uh, we'll be taking a look at Denure Castle next, so we'll see you there. Coastal drama. See you next time. <laughs>